This is Funky and Snarky, and we say welcome, welcome to, to the, the show. show. Hello. I hope everyone had a great 4th of July and didn't get too drunk or sick, but we're back again and today we're going to look at one of our favorite shows, Quincy. If you've never heard of it, it's okay. You might have guessed that we like a little mystery and drama and before there was CSI back in the 70s, there was Quincy starring the wonderful Jack Klugman. And it's his life as a coroner investigating mysterious deaths and so on and so forth. And I know some people are probably missing going to their sporting events over the summer, but if you didn't need COVID to keep you away, we're going to talk about the incident with botulism at the stadium. All right, so Quincy, also known as Quincy M.E., medical examiner, ran for eight seasons from 1976 to 1983. Today's episode we're watching is from Season 5, Episode 21, called Deadly Arena. So the episode opens up at a stadium where the World Cup of Soccer is going to be held on Sunday. And we see a concession stand with the two workers, Arthur and Madeline, who are preparing all their food for Sunday's big game. Arthur's talking about his homemade chili and how he wants to make it big and go on vacation and all that. But they pull out their last jar of chili and open it up and it stinks. (laughs) It stinks bad. And they're like, ooh, we're not going to serve that. We got to get rid of that. It is no good. And she's like, don't throw away here because I don't want to smell it all day. Go into the like janitor's closet and get rid of it. So he takes this big ass jar of chili and dumps it in the janitor's closet sink and tries to wash it down. But surprise, surprise, there's no water running. So he goes back to Madeline she's like oh yeah they're turning off the water because they're they're trying to fix it so he's like okay well whatever I tried and meanwhile there's like the janitor who's working mopping up the floors and stuff and so he opens the door to the janitor's closet and throws his dirty mop water into the sink as well and the sink has like a little tube from the faucet and all of a sudden you see with ominous music playing that like this nasty chili dishwater grossness (laughs) is like starting to back up the tube and go up the faucet then we pan to outside the stadium and there's like this girl with this horrible 70s haircut playing soccer outside and she bumps into this delivery guy who's trying to carry these boxes of hot dogs but keeps dropping them so she goes to help him and gets into the stadium with him No one's like, who's this girl helping you? Security's just like, whatever. She's got a box of hot dogs. She's good. So they go inside and they make the delivery to the concession stand. So the girl just runs off after they made the delivery and runs around the stadium. And I'm thinking that something horrible is going to happen to her. But nothing happens. No security guard kicks her out. Nothing. So the delivery guy who doesn't care about child safety at all just takes a sip of water from the water fountain and leaves. And we transition to the morgue where Quincy works and he's yelling at someone as usual. And then Quincy's boss, Dr. Aston, comes in and Quincy's like, oh, he's going to make me work. And he's like, I don't want to work this Sunday. But then he actually gives him tickets to the soccer game because I guess he got them and can't go. So then we transition back to the stadium where we see a woman taking a drink from the fountain and a security guard comes up behind her and asks if she needs any help and she rambles on about buying tickets for her husband for their anniversary and then he shows her to the ticket office. Then we cut to an electrician who is working in the stadium who also drinks from the fountain. So somewhere on the street, you see the delivery van, which is swerving like crazy, like Jesus just turned water into wine and he can't (laughs) see straight no more. Cars swerve out of the way, and we see Charlie, the delivery man, like driving this van in a sweat, wet, got going like a turbo vet. And 
You can see his eyes are slightly open and he's semi-conscious, yet he doesn't try to take his foot off the gas pedal at all. Like, he is revenant. He's, like, bobbing his head and you're expecting him to slump over the steering wheel because he's about to pass out. But no, he slumps out the delivery side door. I thought he was going to fall out the damn van and onto the street. I did too. His head is like almost smacked against the side mirror and he's just like laying there. I mean, he could have gotten like his head like cut off from like a pole or something. <laughs> like, yeah, that would have been creepy. While passing. And then as it's about to fade out, like you hear the gas like revving more and you're just like does he have a lead foot i don't know but clearly there's a crash that they fade out of and then we cut back to the stadium where the electrician norris who drank from the fountain earlier he's asked by his boss to fix a lighting rig up at the top of the stadium that's really high and freaks me out just looking at it then we're cutting to the escalator repairmen who are fixing this escalator. And when they put up these big sheets of metal, they block the water fountain so that no one has access to it. Then we cut back to Norris, who's now at the top of the lighting rig. He starts coughing and gets dizzy and can't see. He then falls off the lights to the stadium seats below. And just saying, if he was Chuck Norris, he would have had another fist to hold on to, but apparently <laughs> not. Anyway, then we go back to the morgue, and Charlie, well, he did. And Quincy and Sam start the autopsy. They talk about the fact that he's a victim of a crash, but they see a steering wheel pattern on his chest, so they know he was already slumped over before the impact. And Sam says there was no other vehicles, according to the police report. So they determine that something must have made him pass out at the wheel. They later determined that it wasn't heart disease, so he didn't have a heart attack. And they can't do anything else with the autopsy until they get a toxicology report because they don't know what the fuck happened to this guy. Sam says before they can go home, they have to do another autopsy. So they autopsy a woman named Mrs. Davenport. Quincy complains to Sam that all his autopsies have been weird this week. And the woman's husband says that she went into a stroke-like state before death. But that wasn't the cause of death. They need a talk screen on her, too. Later, we cut to Quincy's office where he's looking over said tox reports. Mark, the lab tech, tells him that nothing unusual is found in either body, so they still don't know the cause of death for both bodies. But then Quincy asks the tech to bring some samples to the Department of Health Services. So later that day, the results come back, and oh shit, our victims have botulism. Doom, doom, doom. So they look under a microscope and look at all the botulism in the victims and realize that they had all the same symptoms of impaired vision, loss of muscle control, and disorientation. So the Department of Health Services is going to investigate, but they decide that they need to look at the victim's stomach contents in order to see if there's any common denominators in their their gastric content so hopefully they can figure out if they ate at the same restaurant or ate something in common that would have caused the botulism and hopefully they can figure out what it is before they find another body so Sam and Quincy are working late trying to figure out any leads on to how the victims got the botulism. And they find out that the Department of Health Services discovered that their stomach contents were highly toxic, so they had to have consumed whatever gave them the botulism only a couple hours before their death. So they determined that they had to have been poisoned sometime on Monday morning. They get the results for their stomach contents and nothing seems to match and they don't have any common denominators as far as what they ate. So then Dr. Aston comes in to ask if there are any new leads, which they tell him no. Then he tells Quincy that the Department of Health Services investigator is in his office. Quincy then meets Dr. Janet Carlisle and is surprised that she's a woman. He's not a jerk about it, though. 
She tells him about the investigation. It's a type A toxin. She also tells Quincy that they haven't had any reports of any other victims after reporting to all the hospitals within 200 miles. Quincy then tells her that they know when they ingested the botulism, which is Monday morning. Uh, Quincy says that he's going to re-autopsy both bodies, and if he finds anything new, he'll let her know. And then Quincy tells Dr. Carlisle that she's pretty. <laughs> He kind of stops her from leaving and he's like, you're the prettiest epidemiologist I've ever seen. And it's like, bow, chicka, bow. And she's like, you're too bad yourself, Dr. Quincy. And it's kind of funny because she's pretty like passionate about this shit, just like Quincy, which we find out because she goes over to the hot dog manufacturer where the delivery guy, Charlie, works. His name is Mr. Jackson, and he's helpful until she's like, well, I need the list of all your clients so I can go talk to them to see if Charlie could have picked it up there. And he, like, flips the fuck out and is like, I don't want you bothering my clients. And and he's, like, a little nervous, but she's like, we know that the botulism isn't from hot dogs because it's from, like, bad canning and things like that. But he's all upset and doesn't want the clients involved. And she's like, look, people gonna die. Do you want that on your mind? And he's finally like, fine, I'll give you the list of people. She's like, I'm sorry, Mr. Jackson. Ooh, I am for real. Anyways, back at the morgue, Dr. Aston calls Quincy and says that another person died of a possible neurological disorder. He was an electrician who was injured Monday in a fall and then died at the hospital. That was obviously the guy from the stadium. Quincy and Sam then start the autopsy of the electrician. They didn't find any brain damage from the fall. Sam says that he'll order a full talk screen and Quincy says to send samples to the Department of Health Services also. The next day, Dr. Carlisle comes into the morgue to tell Quincy that his hunch was right. The electrician's fall didn't kill him. He died from botulism. Quincy realizes that they found the location for the botulism since he was injured at the stadium and that was Charlie's first stop delivering hot dogs on Monday. Quincy then tells Dr. Carlisle that their nightmare has only just begun because four days from now, his capacity crowd of 90,000 people are going to be at the stadium watching the World Championship soccer game. So Quincy and Dr. Carlisle head to the stadium and meet Pele, the little girl who's playing soccer. Her real name is Louise, but she goes after the soccer player named Pele. And she's just trying to get in the freaking stadium because she wants to meet the players and is being kind of annoying and we just want to know where the fuck her parents are because she's just hanging around like all day and no one is watching her so quincy and dr carlisle talk to the management at the stadium and basically just let him know that if they don't find the cause they might have to postpone the game and again he flips out He's like, there is no way he's stopping their World Cup game unless there is some sort of restraining order or a bomb threat. And Quincy goes off. Now, when Quincy goes off, he is like super passionate and he kind of like gets his eyes squint and starts talking with his hands because he's like, you don't understand. He's like driving the point home. He's like, there is a bomb on your hands. It's a biological bomb. And all these people are going to be infected and it's going to be on your hands. Not to mention the three people who have already died. And so the guy is like, okay, look, if you can bring me proof that there's something in the stadium, then we'll talk. But until then, you got work to do. So Quincy leaves to go back to the morgue and Dr. Carlisle is going to take over the investigation from here. Quincy wishes her luck. And so then we see Dr. Carlisle with her team of techs instructing them, you know, how to get samples of everything. And it's that botulism is colorless and odorless, but if accompanied by bacterial growth, they're going to be quite pungent. She says if they have any trouble to come and see her. Then Dr. Carlisle talks to the electrician's boss. He says that he didn't bring lunch on Monday because he was supposed to meet his girlfriend, but didn't make it due to the fall. But he didn't see him much during the day. Dr. Carlisle talks to Madeline and Arthur about Charlie. They said that he dropped off the hot dogs, they talked for a bit, and then he left. The team gets samples of their stand. Madeline then asks Arthur, after Dr. Carlisle leaves, if anyone ate the chili. He says no, that he dumped it down the drain. She said she got scared for a bit. 
then later that night, Quincy and Dr. Carlisle meet at Danny's restaurant, which is a popular hangout. And basically, she's lamenting because they didn't find shit on any of their tests. Only thing they confirmed was that Mrs. Davenport was at the stadium on Monday before she died. So because they didn't find anything, they think the source of the botulism may be gone. So they're not willing to postpone the game. Quincy's thinking that they must have missed something, but they don't know what. Meanwhile, back at the stadium, the escalator is being repaired. And finally, the water fountain is uncovered because they've moved away all the debris that was blocking it. Then we see Pele up to her antics again seriously it's late at night where the fuck are her parents yeah i thought parents today were bad being on their iphones i don't know what these parents were that just let their kids in the 70s like in the 80s you kids could kind of do whatever they wanted but then they knew better apparently they didn't though because pele takes a drink of water and then pretty shortly after starts having symptoms and she kind of curls up in this phone booth and is gonna die but she's moaning and groaning because she's got that abdominal pain and luckily a janitor finds her and saves the day bringing her to the hospital so the next day at the morgue sam comes in to see quincy still working even though it's sunday's day off quincy believes the botulism is still there but they haven't found the link between it and the people Sam asks if Quincy and Janet are going to the game. He says yes, and then Sam says, you like her, don't you? Wink, wink. And he says yes. Dr. Carlisle calls Quincy to tell them that their luck just ran out. They found Pele at the stadium with symptoms. She's alive, but not doing very well. They're starting to give her the antitoxin now, but they still can't tell what the source was. Quincy says that there's no doubt now that the poison is in the stadium. And they agree to meet at the stadium later. But at the hospital, the doctor tells Pele's parents that she's okay for now, but she needs rest. And they seem all worried, but where have they been the past three days when her daughter's been running rampant at the ballpark? Just saying. Well, the dad said something like she was supposed to be at the aunt's house, but we don't even see the aunt there. So who knows? So Quincy and Janet are meeting at the stadium and they are chatting with Mr. Mercer, the manager, who still doesn't give a crap about the botulism as long as he puts butts in the seats. Janet kind of goes off and is like, how many dead bodies is it going to take to convince you that the botulism here is real? And he's like, no, I'm not moving the game. It's being televised worldwide unless there's some proof that the botulism came from our food. We're not doing shit. Pretty much. So then Quincy then goes into full Quincy mode again. He tells him that this toxin is so deadly that it could wipe out half of the population of California. And this little girl's life is hanging in the balance and you won't stop this game that you're playing Russian roulette with 90,000 people's lives. Like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Mr. Mercer says he listens to the courts and he doesn't have to listen to Quincy. Janet comes back with the best reply ever and asks if Mr. Mercer is going to be eating here today. He just gets pissed and walks off. So back in the hospital, Pele isn't responding so well to the antitoxin. So they give her another dose. So hopefully she'll come around. So Dr. Carlisle gets off the phone with her department and they've gotten a restraining order so that at least they can't sell any food or drinks at the game. So they go tell the concession stand people, author and Madeline, that they won't be able to sell anything at the game. And Madeline gets kind of pissy, but Arthur's like, eh, it is what it is. As they're about to leave, Janet goes for a drink of water from the water fountain, but Quincy stops her and suddenly realizes that that water fountain wasn't there before, that the parts from the escalator were blocking it, and so it probably didn't get tested. Quincy then asks Arthur, when did they get the escalator working? And he tells them last night. They've been waiting on parts since it shut down on Monday. Quincy then asks, when did they take it apart? And Arthur says, about noon. So Quincy deducts that between noon Monday and Saturday night when they fixed it, there were no new cases of botulism. Quincy asks Arthur to get a maintenance man to shut the fountain down and put up some barricades. Janet says she's going to take some samples right away. 
So this game is about to start in like three hours and they're like scrambling to figure out what they're going to do. And the maintenance man turns off the water in the maintenance closet and Janet comes in and says they won't have any conclusive proof until tomorrow when the samples have been tested. She says that it's probably some sort of spoiled beef that had to be the the source. Quincy asks the maintenance man if there's any way food could have gotten into the pipe somehow. And he responds that the sink that's in the maintenance closet and the fountain are connected. And they're at the end of the pipeline. So whenever there's problems, it's always there, especially when the water is turned off. Arthur and Madeline are also there, and they look worried. Quincy says something contaminated with botulism got dumped in the sink. The water was turned off, and it created a vacuum with the hose that was attached to the sink. Mercer asks Earl the maintenance man if that's true. He confirms Quincy's theory about the siphoning and says that they did shut the water down on Monday. So Arthur asks Earl, did did you say Monday? And he's like, yeah. Then he has to confess that they threw some bad chili down the sink on Monday. He says when he came back to clean it up with the water, once it was turned back on, someone had already done it. And he didn't think that something like this could happen. Mr. Mercer's mad, but then he calms down. He says to Quincy and Janet, what do I do now? And Janet says to barricade all the fountains and order bottled water before the game. Quincy says he needs to flush out the lines right away. Janet adds to let it run and pump chlorine into the system until they've killed off all the bacteria. Mercer says he'll get on it immediately. Back at the hospital, you see Pele finally waking up. There's this creepy moment where the doctor is just staring over Pele and they have this eye contact for a really long time, like a good 10 seconds where the doctor and Pele, the young girl, are just smiling at each other. And it's kind of extra creepy. Yeah, for real. And he's got like his 70s porn stash and he has his hand over her hand and it's just really disturbing because if I woke up from a coma and I saw like some random dude over me, I'd freak the fuck out. Like, if this scene was by itself, I would expect it to be on Law & Order SVU, the 70th (laughs) edition. Maybe the doctor has a ice cream van on the side. I have no idea. But yeah, that was super creepy. But besides that, Pele is going to be okay. Her parents come to see her and are probably trying to figure out who to sue because they neglected their daughter. And they decide to watch the soccer game on TV. So back at Danny's, Quincy, Sam, Dr. Aston, Lieutenant Monaghan, and Sergeant Burl chat about the game. Quincy's team won 4-3 to three in the last period. Dr. Aston says not to mention the other score of the game, crowd 90,000, botulism zero. Sam asks Quincy how did Janet like the game when she shows up and says she liked it very much. Quincy gets her chair and she joins the others. Quincy introduces her to the gang and she says that she just left Pele at the hospital and she's doing better. Also, some of the winning soccer players also paid her to visit. She says the samples that they took were laced with type A botulism toxin. Sergeant Brill says that it's a miracle that they caught it in time. And Lieutenant Monaghan says we got a couple of heroes over here and buys them a round of drinks for Quincy says, you're going to buy? Talk about miracles. They all laugh, and that's the end of the episode. So what were your thoughts on the episode? I mean, the thing I'm most snarky about is the fact that those parents didn't know where their daughter was for, like, three days. I wonder, like, if they didn't find her in the, like, phone booth, would they even report it or missing? <laughs> Seriously, though, I mean, they acted all concerned, but how do you not know your kids like bumming around like stadium like all fucking day? Do they even know she likes soccer? I don't know. It's just a little much. I thought it was funny that Dr. Carlisle was like the lady version of Quincy. It was like super dated that Quincy was all shocked that she was a lady doctor. It's like, doctor is going to have boobs, really? Yeah, but he was like, oh, I just, like, never knew. Like, Like, he found it sexy. But I don't think it was like he didn't know women doctors existed. It was just more like, oh, the health department's epidemiologist is coming. He just assumed it was a guy. And then was charmed that it was a lady. He was pleasantly surprised. But she was all business, which was, like, cool. And she was hard on the issues and shit. 
But I think she comes back in uh, another episode, which we'll probably be reviewing sometime in the future. I also thought it was funny, like, the ominous music when they were, like, panning in on the gross water being siphoned up. Oh my god, up. can we talk about the nasty-ass <laughs> sink for a minute? Because just looking at it made you want to, like, vomit. Yeah, it was pretty gross. And then it like going through the tube. And then I thought it was funny because whenever they were drinking water at the water fountain, it seemed like they were there a long time. And the sound of like the water flowing was like super loud while they drank the water. And I wonder if it's because they weren't actually like drinking the water. So they like put in the sound. The Foley guy was getting his money that day. Quincy is kind of an overdramatic show, but that's kind of what I like about it. Like, the scenes of the delivery man was, like, super over the top. And then when Quincy gets upset with people, it's, like, very over the top. Like, his passion. And it's interesting. And then when, like, Quincy and um, Aston, his boss, like, argue, Sam's always there to just be like, I'm zen, like, don't bother me. Yeah, Sam's awesome. He's super cool, super chill. He's the man with all the test tubes. Sam, the guy from Quincy. (laughs) Anyways, yeah, I like Quincy too. I hate when people yell in shows. I don't know, it just gives me anxiety. That's why I can't watch, like, Judge Judy, because she yells too damn much. And it's like, she does it just to hear the sound of her own voice. But when Quincy does it, you can tell he's doing it not to be an asshole. He's doing it because he's passionate. And he's trying to drill the point home to these people who just don't freaking get it. He's trying to save some lives, people. Yeah, or he's trying to find out, like, the cause of death of these people. Because he knows when something's wrong and people don't believe him until he proves them wrong. And that's why I've always liked Quincy. We watched a lot of Quincy as kids, especially during the summers, because we didn't have anything else to do. There's no internet back then. (laughs) So we would always watch, like, a lot of classic TV. And our dad always liked Quincy, too, so we kind of grew up on that. And this is one of the episodes I remembered from my childhood. And it was totally different from what I remember. Like, I pictured, like, more of, like, a basin sink that was, like, gross. I thought I remembered the chili, like, being shown, like, super gross in the sink. And they didn't really show it until, like, mop water was mixed in with it. So it just looked like orange water. Yeah, I didn't even remember it was chili. I just thought it was something gross in the sink. But it's funny because our dad would never, like, get rid of stuff that was expired. Oh my god. Yeah. I think we had a can that probably had botulism at one point. When cans get botulism, it kind of, like, expands out a little because of the gas. And so, like, I remember having to throw away something. Let's just put it this way. When we were cleaning out the freezer after my dad died last year, there were pesto cubes in there that my grandma made before she died. And she died in 1999. Well, at least it was in the freezer but i know but still it's probably hella freezer burned yeah it's been in there for 20 years (laughs) (laughs) damn that's kind of crazy let's move on to the brain basement All right, now we're entering the brain basement, where we're going to talk a little bit about food poisoning and some nasty food. Because have you ever been over your friend's house to eat and the food just ain't no no good? good. I have. I remember going over to my friend's house to eat. It was for breakfast. I think I had slept over and her mom made some rice porridge thing. Basically, it tasted like soggy cocoa pebbles. And I'm someone who has like texture issues sometimes. I don't really like eat like oatmeal because I can't deal with that texture. And that's exactly what this was. I didn't want to be rude. So I had to like force some of it down. I mean, I didn't need a bottle of K.O. Peptate. Like, it wasn't that bad, but it was just, like, texture-wise, it was hard to swallow. I've always been a picky eater. I think I'm one of those super tasters where, like, my palate's all kind of fucked up, and I don't like a lot of food. I first kind of noticed this when I was at a Mexican restaurant. I tried one of those Mexican sodas. Oh, like Mexican Coke or like? Yeah, it was a Mexican Coke. Yeah, that has like lots of sugar. Well, they use real cane sugar, unlike, you know, America where they use corn syrup or whatever they put in it. Yeah. And it tasted kind of flat to me. I'm like, why isn't this sweet? And that's how I figured it out. Anyway, when I was a young kid, I was three, I think, and I went to like a birthday party at this restaurant called Feral. They would bang the drum on your birthday and stuff. And I ate a hot dog. And when I got home, I like totally got sick off the hot dog. And I've never (laughs) eaten one since. (laughs) 
I also remember when I was in the fifth grade, we'd go to outdoor ed, which is basically like for a week, you go to like a campsite and you're in like a cabin and you eat whatever they have there because you don't got choices. And it was like Asian food night. And it's kind of funny because now I eat like shit ton of Asian food. But when I was in like elementary school, I never ate Asian food. So I only ate the rice, but like everyone else who ate it, like totally got sick. Fortunately, I didn't get sick, but like some people were like vomiting off that Asian food. I mean, and of course, there's always the moldy bread and curdled milk stories, but uh, I think we'll leave it at that for today. Let's uh, move on to our music spotlight. So in today's music spotlight, we decided to take a look at doctor songs. So our first song is David Seville and Witch Doctor. Because I told the witch doctor I was in love with you. Do, do, boom, do, boom. Do. Ooh, ee, ooh, ah, ah, ting, ting, ting walla, walla, bing, bing, bing. Ooh, ee, ooh, ah, ah, ting, ting, ting walla, walla, bing, bing. Yeah, this is a fun song. Obviously, David Seville is better known for creating the Chipmunks. Can I just say that the Chipmunks Great Adventure is, like, still a good movie? <laughs> it is. And <laughs> I is. love the show, too, from the 80s. I know there's, like, a reboot. Well, not the movies, but there's, like, a reboot of the show. But I've never watched it, so I can't tell you if it's good or bad or not. But, like, the new ones are all CG and look weird. Yeah. All right, moving on to number two. One of my favorite bands is Kiss calling Dr. Love. Come in, Dr. Love. I oh. am the Dr. of Love. Dr. Love. I got the girl you're thinking of. Dr. Love. Yeah, I'm a big Kiss fan. Paul Stanley's my boo. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I had to throw this one on. We were lucky enough to see Kiss before everything got shut down. Yeah, it was our last concert before Corona cries. Yeah. Good it was see. my like ninth concert, but whatever. <laughs> Your ninth Kiss concert? Yeah. I was like, I was still sad that my BTS concert got canceled, but what can you do? They'll come back. I'm sad that Coachella got canceled, not that I was going, but just because I wanted to see the Big Bang reunion. Yeah. What can you do? Anyways, um, moving on to number three, it's Miami Sound Machines. Dr. Dr. Beat. Dr. Dr. Beat. This is a fun 80s song. And, you know, Gloria Stefan's awesome. She is. Didn't you see the musical? Yeah, I saw the musical a couple years back when I was in New York. And the lady who was playing Gloria Stefan, like, looked like her and sounded like her, like, so much. That's cool. All right, number four is Jackson Brown's Doctor in My Eyes. Tell me what to do. Doctor in My This is a good song. Good 70s mellow tune. Yeah. Number five is Motley Crue. He's the one that called Dr. Feel Good. He's He's the the one one that makes you feel all right. right. He's the one that called Dr. Feel Good. He's going to be your Frankenstein. (laughs) Yeah, I love Motley Crue. Actually, that's a band I haven't seen live, but I think they kind of retired, so I don't think I'll have a chance to. All right, now our honorable mention, the song we sang a bit of before, it's The Arrogant Worms and Sam, the guy, the guy from, from Quincy. Quincy. Who's the guy with all the test tubes? Sam, the guy from Quincy. He knows Quincy. if you're alive or dead, he'll perform an analysis of your head. Find out if you bleach your hair. Try to fool him if you dare. He's Sam. Sam. The The guy guy from from Quincy. Quincy. Yeah, this is a fun song. I remember when I first heard this, I was like, oh my god, someone actually wrote a song about Sam. Yeah. I didn't know so many people this day and age know about Quincy, so it was kind of a nice surprise. I think this song's from the 90s, so it wasn't that much later. But still. All right, and that's it for our music spotlight. If you want to check out the songs in full, you can check them out on our website. All right, so thanks for joining us as we look back at our favorite Jack Klugman show, Quincy, and join us for a little medical mystery and food drama. (laughs) I hope everyone's staying safe during this corona time, but watch out for that botulism too and all the other things that can get you. Truth. 
have a great weekend and we'll see you next time all right and if you want to drop us a line you can send us an email at spunky and snarky show at gmail.com or you can go to our website at spunky and snarky show dot wordpress dot com or if you want to leave us a voice message you can go to our anchor page which is anchor.fm slash spunky and snarky show thanks again have a great day peace bye